The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit wogcc.com. I want everyone to close their eyes. Whether you're here in the auditorium or whether you're out in the commons or whether you're watching online, just wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think for a moment what comes to mind when you think about God. What sort of image pops up in your head? What sort of feelings do you feel when you think about God? Do you picture an older man, like some wise-looking older person, maybe in a white robe, big beard? Um, Do you picture an authoritarian figure? Do you picture maybe someone that's really hard to please? Do you picture someone that may be really far away and you feel like you have to look way, way, way up to even talk to him and you're not really even sure that he cares or notices? What do you picture when you think about God? You think about someone you have to work really hard to try to make happy and it never feels like you're quite there or quite enough? I want you to open your eyes because every one of us have a picture in our mind of who we think God is. And that picture has been created by a lot of different things that have happened in our lives. That picture of who God is has been created by the way you were raised, the traditions you were brought up in, maybe the imagery that you saw that was connected to God, maybe certain traditions, certain ways of worshiping, Maybe even looking at God through the lens of a parent or an authority figure in your life, and maybe that's how you think God operates or how you view Him. Whatever it may be, we all have our own interpretation and understanding of who God is based on the experiences that we've had and based on the things we've been told. Some of those things we have been told are true. Some of those things we've experienced are true. but Some of those things are not. And before we dive into this series today, I want to communicate something very clearly that has to be at the forefront of this series for us to really grow beyond this point where we're at. And that is that we have to be willing to give up what we've come to think about God for the truth. Jesus said that we'll know the truth and the truth will make us free. And I believe that that is so true if we're willing and open to hear and receive that truth. So what I'm suggesting to you is that if you see something in Scripture, or if you hear something that's taught in Scripture that contradicts with a view of God that's not accurate to who He is, be willing to give up your view for who He tells you that He is. Because He's trying to tell us who He is, and I want to serve God for who He is, not who I want Him to be. Not who I've made Him up in my mind to be, not who I've been told that he was, but rather who Scripture says that he is, who he himself says that he is. That's the God that I want to serve. And my hope and my prayer is that through this series and through this study and through these community groups and through all of this book reading and all the deep diving that we're going to do over the next eight weeks, exploring and and exhausting this topic, that we have a clearer view of who God is and not just a clearer view of who he is, but also a clear view of how he sees us. Because how we see God and how we view God, it really is the most important thing about us because it affects every single area of our lives. How we see God and how we view him and what we think he's really about and what he's really like will determine whether or not we believe he's true to his word, whether he's faithful. Can we really go to him, approach him, and he's actually listening to us? How we view God depends on the way we'll view the efforts that we put into this thing and what we do and what we feel like is required and expected out of us. And it affects and touches every area of our life. It doesn't matter if it, it can touch our marriage, it can touch the way we raise our children, the way we work, it can, uh, the priorities we have in our life, the way we view God. It touches everything, and it really is the most important thing about you and me. And so I want to make sure that we here at this local church, that we're diving into Scripture to allow us to have the most accurate view of God and that we can free ourselves from any misinterpretations of who we thought He is or how He should be so we can worship Him, serve Him, and live for Him and trust Him for who He is and who Scripture says He is. Amen? 
So that's the journey we're going to go on over the next eight weeks, and we're going to kick it off with this sermon called, What is Your First Domino? You can write that title down if you would like to. If you set up a row of dominoes, and then each corresponding domino is just a little bit bigger than the next one. Actually, there was some research done on this, believe it or not, domino research. If you make the next domino 1.67% bigger than the previous domino, then the, the energy, the kinetic energy that's transferred once you topple those dominoes over in a row will be transferred to the next and the next and the next and the next and the next to the point to where in about 10 steps that you could knock down a domino that's 26 feet high with the energy of just a normal sized domino at the very beginning. And so when we think about what God has called us to do and what God wants us to do, we read these stories and hear these stories about these people like Moses who did these great things for God or King David, or maybe we read about the Apostle Paul and we think these guys have done something so big, what in the world could I ever do that could really matter in the eyes of God or that could ever really change or make a dent or an impact in eternity? But you need to remember that all of those big things that we read about and that we hear about, they all started with one domino. They all started with something small, something that didn't seem like it had the power on its own necessarily to go and to knock down that big thing and to have that big impact. But yet that one thing had enough power built up because it touched the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it carried over and carried over and carried over. And then all of a sudden you began to see the effect of the church realizing what their first domino is and beginning to be faithful in the areas God has called them to. So what is your first domino? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Truth is that every one of us, whether we realize it or not, we all have a first domino. It creates who we are, and then who we are touches the next person, the next situation, the next issue, the next ministry. And if we could ask some of the greatest leaders in the Bible, what their first domino was, I wonder what they would say. If we could sit down and interview them and ask them, what was your first domino? What was the first thing you did? What got Moses up out of bed in the morning and drove him to do what he did? What about the great King David, man after God's own heart? What about the Apostle Paul, the man who was beaten 39 times because typically they believed that at that 40th strike, that's when you were dead. So he was one last shy of death, but he still kept serving God. What was that guy's first domino? What was the thing that motivated him, that inspired him, that kept him focused on what really mattered? Let's go over to Exodus chapter 33, and let's look at these three different individuals, and let's see what exactly that motivation was. Exodus chapter 33. Here we're going to read about an interaction that Moses has with God. In Exodus 33, we're going to start reading in verse 12 where this interaction begins to happen. Exodus 33 and 12 says, Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways. I want you to underline that or write that down. Show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people." And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my own name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. 
And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Isn't this interesting? As we read this story about Moses, who has seen God's power in operation, Moses, who has seen the Red Sea parted. Moses, who has seen all of the different plagues come on the Egyptians for not letting the people of God go. Moses, who has seen the Ten Commandments written by the very hand of God. Moses, who has led the children of Israel over a million people who are daily being fed manna, this bread that just comes from heaven. And then he's taking care of them by sending them flocks of quail at night. You, you, see, you see all these different miracles and all these different ways, all these different things that God has done. And out of everything that Moses could say or Moses could ask, Moses says, I want to see your glory. I want to know you more. I want to see everything about you. Moses' first domino was that he wanted to know God more. Let's skip down into chapter 34 of Exodus and let's read in verse 6 when God actually did this thing that Moses asked. uh, Chapter 34 of the book of Exodus and verse 6. Then the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. I would imagine so. After hearing God speak and begin to describe himself. He was telling Moses, this is who I am, the Lord, the Lord, who is gracious, who is slow to anger. As Moses is hearing all of this, oh my goodness, could you imagine what's going on in his mind? He just wanted to know God more, and it immediately stirred his heart to want to worship him. What about David? A man who God had taken from the fields, watching his father's sheep, and made him king. Out of all of his brothers, out of all of the the older brothers, the ones who were military men, the ones who looked like they had all of the goods to be qualified to be the king, when Samuel the prophet came to anoint the next king, he looked at all of Jesse's sons and he says, is this all? Are these all your kids? He said, well, I got another kid, but I didn't think you'd want to see him. I got this, you know, redheaded son. He's like, he's, he's watching my sheep. He probably smells really bad, but I mean, if you want to see him, I mean, I can send somebody to go get him. And he's like, yeah, go send for him. And as soon as he sees David, God says, this is the guy. The one who was elevated from a place of not even being recognized by his own dad in the lineup of who could possibly be the king is the one that God chose to elevate to that position of being the king. And out of everything he saw happen in his life, out of all of the great things God did through David, what would David say? What would be the the thing he would want most from God? Psalm 27 and 4, David writes this. He says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He just wanted to know God more. Out of everything that he could have petitioned God for, everything he could have asked, he says, I just want to know you more. This is my priority. Because listen, it wasn't because Moses and David were super hot shots that they got to do the things that they ended up doing. Because if you look at the life of Moses, he had issues. Moses was a murderer. He had murdered one of the the Pharaoh's guards. And this guy was being chased around. People were were wanting Moses' head. And he's hiding out of fear of his life. And then even beyond that, when he sees God move, he has anger management issues. Because God said, speak to the rock and water will flow from it. And he got so upset, he takes his staff and he just whacks it to make water flow out of it. Because he's just so upset at these people. He, he, he takes the stone tablets, throws them down when he sees that they're worshiping a false god. 
All this stuff. He wasn't this perfect guy. How about David? David wasn't perfect, but the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. David sees someone bathing on a rooftop while everyone's at war, and he he should have been with them at war, but he wasn't. And he was checking out the rooftop bather, and he says, I like what I see. And he asked someone to go and get her for him, and he wanted to sleep with her. And then she's, she's married. Oh, no. And now she's pregnant. Oh, no. What are we going to do? So David takes that woman's husband and puts him on the front lines of the battle, guaranteeing his death. And he dies. And he's still called a man after God's own heart? How in the world could that be? I'll tell you how, folks. Because God uses broken people, not perfect people. God uses broken people. God didn't choose Moses because of his patience and warm personality. God didn't choose David because of his high moral compass. He chose them because these were the people. Man, they understood something. They saw value in God that others just quite didn't grasp. They wanted, Moses could have had anything. Then God said, you found favor in my sight. What do you want me to do? What does he say? Does he say, show me more of your your power. I want to see more of your mighty acts. Remember, I had you underline ways. I told you to write that down when he said, teach me your ways. Isn't it amazing that when we have a need, when we have a challenge or something happen in our life, we say, God, I need you to intervene. I want your acts. I want your power to show up and to supernaturally change this situation, whether it be a health issue, whether it be a family issue or a relational issue, a financial issue. God, I need a miracle. I need you to show up. And we're asking God to come and intervene supernaturally and to do something because we're wanting his, we're wanting his, his, his acts, his power. We're wanting him to change the situation. And Moses had that opportunity. God said, you found favor. What do you want? He didn't say, God, I want to see more of your acts. No, he said, Lord, teach me your ways. I want to know who you are. I don't want the miracle. I want to know the miracle worker. I don't just want you to do something for me. I want to know who you are. Teach me your ways. Teach me about you. Teach me more about you. Show me your glory. That was the cry of Moses' heart. David, writing songs, writes in Psalm 27, he said, one thing I've asked, this one thing I'm asking that I could to see your beauty, Lord. This is what I want. This is my first domino. This is the thing that's going to start the chain reaction of everything else, and it's going to touch everything else. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff will be taken care of. We, we want to reverse engineer everything when God does something for someone. We see God maybe provide a financial miracle for someone. Or we see God uh, heal someone physically and we're like, wow. Or we see someone who has a great marriage or someone who has really healthy relationship with their children and they're raising good godly kids. And we ask them, what's the secret? What do I do? Because we just want that thing that they have. But the thing is, is that we aren't supposed to just chase after the thing in order to get it. The thing came as a result of the first domino being the right domino. Because we all have a first domino, and for some of us, it's financial security. For some of us, it's being good enough in someone else's eyes. Maybe for some of us, we're still trying to please that parent that we couldn't please because we had four A's and one C, and we heard more about the one C than the four A's. And we're still trying to please that parent out of our woundedness and get an attaboy or a girl. And we take this into our relationship with God, and it becomes our first domino. It becomes the most important thing to us. And we want that one thing so bad because we think it's so important. And, and, and we think that in order to get everything else that we think we need to have in life, that it's some formula, it's some system, it's some, it's some how-to. And so we just go search all of the self-help shelves and we search all of the how-tos and all the step-by-step programs to try to get what we think we're supposed to have. And we chase after this person. We go to that church, that church, this speaker, that speaker, this event, that event. And we're looking for something. And Moses is saying, 
God, I just want to know you more because this is the priority. Because out of that priority, it hits the next thing. And then it hits the next thing. And the next thing. Are you hearing me this morning? And it hits the next thing and the next thing. David's saying, my priority is to just want to see his beauty, know him for who he is, and then it hits the next thing. It rubs up against the next thing, and it carries all of that energy from that first domino, and it begins to shape and change and mold your life to where then your life becomes a testimony of the goodness and the glory of God because you're seeking him first. That's why Jesus said all these other things will be taken care of if you get this one right. And isn't it funny that out of all of those dominoes, as they begin to increase in size one after the other, isn't it interesting that that one domino, the only one that we ever really touch, the only one we have anything to do with is the smallest. We always think we'll get involved when it's something big and God's like, well, what about this one thing that's rather easy and simple? And it looks small, but it carries so much force. And it's so important. And it's the only one you can touch. You don't touch all the other things that the first thing in your life responds to. You can't touch all the... You can try. You can try to control everything. You can try to make everything happen. But the only one you touch is the first one. And David's first domino was to seek God. Moses' first domino was to seek God. And God is using broken people just like you or me. Just like you and me. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul, man. Guy was a workaholic. He was a workaholic. This guy, he began to list all of his credentials. And you could tell this guy had worked really hard to climb the corporate ladder of the Pharisees. He had worked really hard and tried his best to achieve all of the merits and all the marks. His merit badge little thing, his sash was full. That's who the Apostle Paul was. And he's saying, you know what? These things don't really matter anymore in response to Christ. Because go over to Philippians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go over there. Ephesians. I mean, Philippians chapter 3. Let's check this out. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. But whatever gain I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them all as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. He said that I might gain him. I want to know him more. And that word knowing in the Greek is the word epigenosko. It's not just the normal Greek word for knowing, like I want to know someone more. That would be a a knowledge. That would be just the word gnosko. But when you add epi to the word gnosko, it's like a supercharged, superpowered, deep, heartfelt, intentional knowing, a passionate, heartfelt knowing. And that's what Paul used when he said, I count all of my trophies, all of my credentials, all of my earning, all of my workaholism, I count it all as rubbish and loss, all my trophies are garbage, he says. He actually uses a very strong word. We translate it in the King James as dung, doo-doo. It's, it's nothing. It's worthless, he says, in comparison to pursuing knowing Christ. All of that stuff, he said, doesn't matter. So as we're looking at pursuing God, we need to understand that that first domino is truly to want to know him more. He's saying all your wealth, all your prestige, all the press, all the money, all the intellect, all the background, all the education, all of it's like rubbish in comparison to knowing the value of him, knowing Christ. Chip Ingram, the author of the Real God book that we're going through He's quoted as saying this, when our first domino is a passion to know God and see him accurately, our first domino will impact the lives of people beyond any spiritual activity. (laughs) He says, when our first domino is to know God more, to know him accurately, to want to be able to see him accurately, that will have a bigger effect, a bigger impact than any spiritual activity we could do. It's so important that we see God for who he is because we want to make sure we're looking at God accurately and not chasing after some idea of who we think God is. 
who we want him to be, who we feel like he should be. No, God, I want to know you for who you are. And if that means I have to make some changes in my life, then I need to make those changes, amen? Because he's trying to help us. He's trying to show us the better way. He's trying to show us the pathway to healing, the pathway to wholeness. He's trying to show us it's all in him. It's not in anything else. It's not in that relationship. It's not in more money. It's not in the house. It's not in the acceptance. No, it's all in him. And he's trying to show us that. But what is our first domino? Because no priority of ours should be greater than to seek God and know him more. No priority of ours should be greater than to seek him. See your domino and my domino. It doesn't have to be big. Isn't that awesome? It doesn't have to be big, and we don't have to have it all together. It's not get it all together, figure it all out, and then come to God. And then maybe, just maybe, he'll be happy with you. That's the idea that a lot of us have, but that's not the reality and the truth of who God is. He's wanting us to want to know him more, to see him for who he is. And our first domino, man, it doesn't have to be big, but the kinetic energy goes into the next one and the next one. It's us passionately following him. And if your life is a reflection of a passion to know God and to see him accurately, then your domino will impact the lives of people beyond any spiritual activity, any program, any church growth stuff you can learn in all the world. And if you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. John 1 and 18, Jesus himself says, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. He's made him known. So you want to know what God's like? You want to know what's important to God? Look at Jesus. And that's the beauty of the gospel is that we can have relationship with Jesus. We can get to know Jesus through his word, through fellowship, through worshiping, through serving him. We can get to know him more and more through connecting with others in Christ-centered community, through having other people rub off on us with the things they've grown in and the experiences they've had. And we begin to see God more and more at work in the lives of people. You want to know how God feels towards someone who makes tragic mistakes and who's deeply sorry for them? Look at the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. What did Jesus say? Man, that was an offense in their day that was punishable by death. People were ready to stone this woman. And how did Jesus, how, what is important to God? This woman who, it wasn't like, it was like rumors like, hey, this lady, she's sleeping around, okay? No, it's like she was caught in the act. How embarrassing would that be? Caught in the very act of adultery. And now she's been drug out in the streets and she's in front of all these men who have stones ready to cast judgment. And they look at Jesus because they're trying to get him in a catch-22. They said, what do you say about this, Jesus? And Jesus tells the woman, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's how God feels about when we've messed up. That should be freeing. Hello, somebody. You want to know how, how God feels towards the religious above everyone else type of people? He calls them you whitewashed tombs, you snakes, you vipers, you religious phonies, you hypocrites. That's what he says to them. That's, that's how God feels about people who try to act like they've got it all together and they're better than everyone else. God is trying to show you what's important to him. It's not important that you play some part or you play some role. What's important to him is that you seek to know him for who he is. We need to know God for who he is, not who we think he is or who we want him to be. When our view of God becomes low, he becomes the self-help genie or he gets mixed up with the American dream. Or he's the old man with the white beard that says, ha, pfft, you know, pfft, whatever, don't worry about anything, it's cool. You know, grace is going to cover it. You can live together those morality issues. I was just kidding, don't worry about it. Or he's a harsh, arms crossed, toe tapping, legalistic, why did you mess up? You don't measure up. You need to get with the program like he's some sort of meanie. Maybe God's kind of like this. Good, Landon. 
Hey, what you listening to? When you think about God, who do you imagine he is? Do you see him as someone who likes to give you good things? And what do you think that really means, anyway? Does it mean he's kind of like... A vending machine? I was going to say a magic genie, but sure, vending machine works. Let's go with that. That's, that's, that's weird. No, I don't think it's that weird. And the elevator's broken anyway, so you might as well go along with it. Hey, what's in there? There you go. That's the spirit. Anyway, as I was saying, if we see God like a vending machine, we might think he's just there to grant our wishes, to give us the stuff that's most important to us. It's... With a never-ending supply of... Whatever we want. Sounds pretty cool, right? Maybe you're like Diana, and you want to be the MVP of the softball team. Punch in D6. to be really popular. That's C3. Yeah! Or maybe you want that report card with all A's on it. Punch in B5. But... Maybe God is a vending machine? This is such a good idea. Sure, it's great to punch in whatever you want, but... Hey! What if God has a purpose for you that's greater than just getting what you want? Maybe God knows that what we want isn't always what we need. The Bible says God is so good and loves us so much, not to just always give us everything we ask for. Sometimes the things we pick fall apart in our hands. God cares more about giving us what we need instead of what we want. Really? Come on! Did you know that what you think about God is the most important thing about you? So how should you think about God? Maybe it's better if you let God tell you who he is and base your picture of him on what he says about himself. The real God loves to give you good things, but he's only going to give you what's best for you. We need a healthy view of God. Amen. Amen. Every issue in your life can be traced back to a faulty view of God. Every issue can be traced back to a faulty view of Him. Because it's not only who we think He is, but it's how we think He sees us. So let's close our eyes again for a moment. And I want to ask you again, who is God? What does he look like? When was the last time you were excited, exhilarated even, passionately excited to worship him? 
When were you last excited and hungry to read his word? When were you last stirred with a passion to serve him? When was the last time you wept by the overwhelming awareness of his presence? Look back up here. I want to give you this today. I want to give you a brand new set of glasses. I want you to know that the answer is not in trying harder, working harder, some new program, but yet it's a new set of glasses through which you see the world and you see God. It's the passion to start the day like Moses or to start like David or Paul The point is, is that my passion, my first domino, should be to know the real God. And before we close, I want to invite you to take kind of a heart check quiz. You can write them down. You can think about it now, whatever the case may be. I just want you to revisit this. And here are the four areas that this kind of self-evaluation covers. Number one, those who really know God have great energy for God. Number two, those who really know God have great thoughts about God. Number three, those who really know God have great boldness for God. Number four, those who really know God have great contentment in God. And I want you to be honest. Are these things being manifested in your heart? and in your life. Dig deep so that you'll have a clear picture of where you're at today and where you want to go because we're beginning this journey to dive into understanding who the real God is together, to seek Him with our whole heart so we can be able to see our Heavenly Father for who He really is. My prayer is that we're going to experience a deeper relationship with God as a result and that it will impact literally everything in your life and in this church. Amen. So God, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for showing us who you really are. I pray that through this real God study that we go through over the next few weeks, and as we commit to being in community groups and reading the book, and as we're going through all these different materials and hearing these messages and discussing them with others, And as our children are hearing this message and as our teenagers are hearing this message, God, I just pray that you would work in and through this focused, intentional campaign and series in a way where we will come out at the end of this series having had experienced you in a new way and have known you more and that we would rid ourselves of all of the junk all the misconceptions that we thought about you so that we can be free and truly put you first and seek you first and allow seeking you to be our first domino. Lord, I pray that you would stir in us a passion to know you more like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a deep sense of unease in our rapidly changing world. We all know something has been lost, but we don't know why or where it all leads. Pop culture tells us it's all about me and that we should worship our own creations rather than the creator. In politics, the end justifies the means. In relationships, love means self-satisfaction. In life, status and appearance are what count. In the church, confusion replaces clarity and conviction. Our faulty and distorted view of God is at the root of all our problems. But what if we view God differently? What if we saw him the way he longed for us to see him? We can worship a God who is holy, wise, and just, one whose faithfulness and goodness are matched by his power and sovereignty over all things. This is a God who can deliver us from evil and transform lives. This is a God worth worshiping. The way back, the path of hope starts with knowing God for who he really is. We need to know the real God. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit wogcc.com.